In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are our nature, sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you, 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 we have In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. Amen. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring to it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Christ, our support and defense in every need, continue to preserve your church. 
You may be seated. Uh, we're going to start with the thought of the day uh, with uh, Erna Adam. Come on up. Oh, good morning. It's so beautiful to see the church right full to the back. God bless you for being here. Anyway, the thought of the day is uh, something that many of us have maybe thought about when, as you will see when the story evolves, uh, you'll see where it goes. A lady went to the pastor and said, I won't be attending church anymore. And he said, may I ask why? She said, I see people on their cell phones during the service. Some are gossiping, some just ain't living right, and they all are just a bunch of hypocrites. The pastor got silent and thought for a bit, and he said, okay, but can I ask you to do something for me before you make a final decision? And she said, what's that? And he said, would you take a glass of water and walk around the church two times and don't let any water fall out? Now I have my friend Barb here and she's gonna do a little demonstration just in front because I thought walking around the church two times would be a little cumbersome. <laughs> now watch her, is she, what she's doing? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, okay, he told her to take the glass of water and walk around the church. She said, yes, I can do that. She came back and said, well, it's done. He asked her three questions. Did you see someone on their phone? Did you see anybody gossiping? Was there anybody living wrong? And she said, I didn't see anything because I was focusing on the glass of water. <laughs> when you come to church, so he told her, when you come to church, you should be just focused on God so that you don't fall. That's why Jesus said, follow me. He did not say follow Christians. Don't let your relationship with God be determined by how others relate with God. Let it be determined by how focused you are on God. We are on God. And I do that quite frequently. I take a glass of water in the morning, sometimes before bedtime to my room and I know exactly what it's like, and I'm kind of feeble at times, and I gotta walk very careful with my glass of water to the bedroom from the kitchen. So I understood this very well, and I just think that it's, uh, it's something that we all um, take for granted because we're so privileged to have the church, and maybe others don't see it our way, but maybe if you think of, of a glass of water, how soon it would spill if we weren't focused on it it would change our mind. God be with you. And I would ask everybody to share the peace. Reach out your head, stand up if you can, and reach out to the person beside you, behind you, in front of you, and share the peace. God be with you.
first lesson, <clears throat> first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 to 10. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The mouth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and who obeys the voice of his servant? Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. This is the word of the Lord. We'll read uh, Psalm 116, verse 1 to 9. <clears throat> I love the Lord because he has heard my voice. Thank you. 
The lesson is from James chapter 3, 1 to 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining for the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth the same opening, fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Today we're reading from Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 14 to 29. It says, When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to Jesus and greeted him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And he answered them, oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? 
How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can... All things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you to come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose, and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. This is the gospel of our Lord. We now will sing the Apostles' Creed.
It's like giving your hand to Jesus and knowing he won't let go. Trust him because he loves me so. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the one who died for you and for me and who was raised to life on the third day, never to die again. It's pretty cool to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I grew up in this church and uh, my, my, my dad was an elder. Uh, my mom led a lot of EBSs and helped with the children's ministry. Um, and uh, this is where me and my siblings gained a foundation in our faith and uh, grounded us in the scriptures, raised us in his ways and his will, and uh, we will be eternally grateful to this church for that. And uh, you did a pretty, you do a pretty fantastic job at what you guys do. Like this service was so cool, so awesome, God honoring. And uh, so it's kind of surreal for me to be here, um, <clears throat> but it's really cool. So it's an honor. And it's a privilege. Uh, and I don't take this lightly. I don't take preaching, uh, you know, sharing, sharing the word of God very lightly. As uh, we read James 3. Thank you who chose James 3 today. And because uh, <laughs> teachers uh, will be judged <laughs> more harshly. But, you know, Pastor Schemen, if, if, if any of y'all remember Pastor Schemen, he always used to bring that up with us about how the responsibility of taking the scriptures and exposing it and, and, and talking about it, um, the, the seriousness of that. And so I was in prayer today, no, I was in prayer this, this last week and a bit um, into, you know, Lord, what do you want to, to what do you want to focus on? Because there's a lot that we could take out of this gospel message. There's, um, you could have a whole sermon series on it, right? Um, so what, it, what is it that you want us to focus on today? And what he laid on my heart is what um, the Father said that we say, Oftentimes in, in Lutheran churches, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. <clears throat> and I think that's just the journey of life in a lot of ways. We all experience what this father experienced in life. I can tell you stories of my life where I was faced with an issue and I could have chosen unbelief. I could have sat in my unbelief or I could have chosen belief and ask the Lord to help me with my unbelief. For those of you who aren't aware, I serve at uh, uh, the chapel in West Edmonton Mall, and I was the director for the past few years. And it is a very expensive place to run. And uh, in the middle of a pandemic, I, you could imagine how finances were, were going. And every month, I knew, I saw what God was doing there. I saw the work he had. We, we had people f coming in, hearing the good news, giving their life to Jesus, people getting healed, people getting delivered, people getting revived, you know, whatever the case may be. The, the Lord's hand was upon that ministry, and he was doing a good work. So I knew, I believed that he was going to show up and take care of this place because it's his home. But at the same time, there was that little seed of doubt. There was that little bit of disbelief that little bit of unbelief that caused me to question. And so we cry out as followers of Christ, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. <clears throat> and I know I've struggled with that, and maybe you haven't, but I know many other people have. And <clears throat> it's something that we all struggle with because, believe it or not, I believe everybody acknowledges that there's God. That there is a God. There is a, some level of belief in everybody's heart and mind that there is a God. And I've and I experienced this. I talked to a lot of different people. And some of you may say, well, what about atheists? That's a good question. And uh, I'll share a story. 
around that. A mentor of mine shared this with me, and he said that after he had an event, did an event, an atheist, come, uh, a man came up to him and said, he said to my friend, he said, I'm an atheist. My friend said, cool. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. And, uh, and he said, well, aren't you going to say anything? Aren't you going to ask me a question? Aren't you going to tell me something? Aren't you going to say that I should believe in God? And my friend said, well, maybe, if you're honest with me. He's like, well, I can, I can be honest. He said, no, no, like gut-wrenching honest, like honest, honest. He's like, okay, I can be honest. I, can, I will be that honest with you. Let's have the, the conversation. And my friend said, now, I want to paint a picture for you. Imagine you had the best day of your life, like a really good day. Like you wake up, your wife made your favorite breakfast, coffee's ready to go, it's beautiful, birds are singing, it's a good morning, you woke up rested, you weren't woken up abruptly by some annoying alarm clock, you, you get ready for the day, it's peaceful, there's no traffic on your way to work, you get to work, you're productive, it's effective, you get a promotion, not just by name, but also a pay raise. And you know, your friends are giving you accolades, it's a great day, you're on your way home, you're having a good time there's no traffic again you know you're listening to your best tunes the sun is shining it's beautiful weather you get home your kids run up to you and they say we missed you dad we love you dad and they just give you big hugs and your wife has supper ready and it's your favorite meal on the table you know and it's a great night you, you, you spend time with your, 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 your family you have some time with your wife in the evening and at the end of that day is there anything in you just the slightest amount that says, thank God. And my friend said, this guy kind of thought for a second, he said, yeah, there is. My friend said to him, do you know why? And the guy said, no. He said, it's because you were created by him. You are an image bearer of God, and there's something in you that acknowledges that. And when you have a great day like that, you want to thank someone. You want to thank the person who gave that to you. And so we all have different levels of belief and unbelief in our hearts. And that's our life. Our life is a series of decisions where we choose belief in who God said he is, what he's done, and who we are through that, or choosing unbelief, where we choose to believe in the lie of who God is, the, the lie that the enemy has deceived us with. But here's the other thing. And I find that this is very interesting, that most people have this, this spectrum of belief, but my experience at the chapel, my experience in ministry, is that people flock to Jesus. Pe people love Jesus. And we see this in the story, that in verse 15, it said, people flocked to Jesus. When Jesus arrived, the crowd went to him. They were around the disciples. They were around the scribes. They were around these religious leaders. They were around a crowd. They were around an issue. And, and, they, and they were squabbling about it. But what did they do when Jesus came? They flocked to Jesus. And so there's something in our heart that loves Jesus, that wants to be around him. And yet, we have this heart for Jesus, this heart for God. And yet, we all struggle with unbelief. We all struggle with believing lies about who God is. See, the scribes in the story, we, we could probably guess what they were talking about because we see their interactions with the disciples in the past, that they, they were probably questioning um, the legitimacy of their ministry. Well, if, you're, if you serve the Messiah, then why can't you cast this, this, this demon out of this kid? You know, So they had the disbelief that God is only real if he shows up, that God is only real if, if he actually answers your prayers like a genie. God is only real if a man can prove it. The disciples, their disbelief, their limiting belief around God was that it's up, it, it was their own strength, right? They thought it was up to them. It was in their own power. And that's either going to be found in arrogance or humility, right? False humility, humility. Arrogance in the sense that you think you're, you know, your butt's a cream puff and everyone wants a bite and you have the power to change the world. Or false humility where you're like, why would God use me? I'm nothing. The father... You know, it, what the, the unbelief that he struggled with was, was disbelief. Could God really heal my son? Could God do something that amazing? I don't know. It's a risk. It's a scary thing to believe. To believe in the impossible. The crowd, well, the crowd always will push the fear of man on you. They'll always say, you know, what's the safest thing? Because they don't want to stand out in a crowd. The masses, we, we see in, in, in verse 25 and 26 that, you know, that's a, I'll just read it quick for you here. It 
And when Jesus saw that the crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, so he rebuked it before the, the negative came, right? He was like, I'm going to do this before more disbelief is around me. Because he was helping the father with his unbelief, right? And then we see it again, um, you know, when, when they say, well, he, you know, he, look at him, he's dead. He's not, he's, he wasn't healed. He actually just died, right? And so we see this in the crowds and we see this in life where, where the masses will sp- speak disbelief. Well, that's not true. God doesn't really work that way. But God put it on your heart to do that. People of the crowd said when I, started, when I started serving at the chapel, that's impossible. It's never going to work out. It's, it's a pandemic. It's, it's, there's no money. There's, it's, it's an idiotic move to start a ministry at that time. But yet God said, start that ministry. And so who am I going to listen to? Would I listen to the, in my opinion, very wise people, or am I going to listen to God? God. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, baby girl. And I did, right? I chose to step out in obedience, and God showed up. And the boy, you can only imagine the disbelief that he was wrestling with. He was mute. The enemy had such darkness around him that he was mute. He couldn't talk. And sometimes the unbelief in our hearts cause us to close our mouths, to not speak anything. And I think it's really cool that we talked about, James, we read James chapter 3. We will get into that. <clears throat> but we also get rigid. The darkness can cause us to be rigid because all that unbelief is is the lies that we believe from the enemy. The darkness, the prevailing darkness in the world that is trying to take you out of a relationship with God and put you in the world, looking at the world for your answers, looking at the world for your direction, for your belief, for your salvation. And eventually, you just, it just throws you to your death like it did for this boy. It will throw you to your death. It will continually try to throw you into the darkness, deeper and deeper. And you may be hearing this, and you may know somebody on your heart who struggles with belief. You yourself may be in a situation where you're struggling with belief. Even reading this passage about Jesus casting out a demon, you may, well, you know, demons aren't real. This is just a, this is just a fairy tale. Well... I would encourage you to ask Jesus to show you, and uh, you'll be surprised. I know that you guys have a phenomenal healing ministry here, and uh, you probably have experienced these things. But the reality is, is that we all fall short. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we can see in verse 20, when, when the crowd was bringing the boy to Jesus, that he started, the, the, the demon started to manifest even more and fight tooth and nail to keep this boy from Jesus. And he does that to you today, today. He does this to you and others as well today. That when you are convicted of where you have fallen short and you're like, I need to go to the cross with this. I need to go to Jesus with this. He's going to do everything in his power to keep you away from that. He's going to mess with you any way that he can. He's going to thrash. He's going to manifest. He's going to throw things at you. He's going to sucker punch you. And you need to just fight that. you got to fight against it, right? The beautiful thing about the boy is that he had friends. He had a community around him helping him to get to Christ. And that's what we do here as a church. We're a community that brings each other to Christ. But the reality is, is that many of us choose to stay and and, and succumb to the, the, the enemy's, you know, efforts. Because it's easier to choose fear over faith. It's easier to choose unbelief. It would have been easier for that father to say, well, I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus, but, you know, if you can't do it, then I guess, you know, hope is lost. It's easier to be a slave to sin, a slave to the the world, than to be free in Christ. But immediately after hearing the truth, after Jesus, you know, rebuked his disciples, rebuked the people there, and and, and said to the, 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 the Father that it can be done, Immediately after hearing the truth, from truth itself, the father repents and cries to God in his lack, saying that what everyone is hoping for. Believe me, believe you me, everyone had this on their heart, and I believe everyone has this on, on their heart today. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. We believe in Jesus, but there's aspects of our lives where like, man, like, I need to believe that Jesus is going to show up in this. Help me with my unbelief. The reality is is that you don't need to be all put together to go to God and receive favor. You know? The the father didn't believe fully in what Jesus said. When Jesus said, you know, for you... Here, let me just read it quick for you. If you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. 
All things are possible for the one who believes. And the father heard this and repented. And he said, I believe. Help my unbelief. He was acknowledging, I believe God, but I still have doubt. I still have struggles. And so do we today. We have struggles. We wrestle with these things. And so are we going to Christ on these things? Are we seeking him to help us with our unbelief? Or are we just settled? We're just going to settle. Okay, yeah, I believe this, but I don't believe this. You know, the word says this, but you know, that's okay. I encourage you to not be like that. Because even in our brokenness, we can approach Christ and his merit fills the lack of ours. His belief, his faith stands in place of ours. You know, he never doubted. He never lacked belief. Throughout his whole life on this earth, he never succumbed to the darkness, to the lies of the enemy once. And because he did that, because he overcame, when he died on that cross, ladies and gentlemen, when he died on that cross, he took all the punishment, all the sin, all the blame, all the shame on it for you. So even in your disbelief, if you come to God, he'll show up because of what Jesus did. Not because of what you did or didn't do, but because of the cross. But it doesn't end there. He not just died for you and took that sin on the cross, he rose to life on the third day. This tells us too many great things. But one of them is that there was nothing that kept him down. So your unbelief, your disbelief in what God is able to do, the lies that you're telling yourself about God is not preventing God from, you know, connecting with you. And it's not preventing you from being able to connect with God. But it's actually Christ paid the price so that even in your disbelief, just like this father, you can go to God and say, I don't believe, but help me. I was talking to a young man and... Uh, he, he was wrestling with the faith, and he said to me, I said, who's Jesus to you? And he said, I don't really know. I'm kind of trying to figure this out. I used to believe, and I'm really wrestling with this. And most people who say that to me, I, they're probably thinking I'm going to, like, retort with some smart, you know, apologetics or something like that. But I just said to him, okay, that's fine. You know, it's a journey. I said, did you know that some of the disciples even doubted in the, during the ascension? You don't have to be arrived today. Just seek him. He'll show himself to you. And there's a life without that if we seek him. Because not only that him raising from the dead showed us that there was nothing that could keep him down, it also showed that us that death was defeated, that there is a life apart from sin. And we can, we can uh, have a taste of that today by seeking him, by allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts. And he ascended. 40 days after he ascended, and now, believe it or not, he is praying for you. He's praying for each and every one of you. He's interceding for you. He's interceding for the ones you love, for the ones that are lost. He's interceding for everyone, cheering you on, you know, praying that your faith does not fail you, praying that in your disbelief, you choose to believe. You choose to step out in faith. Because there's a world out there that is continually trying to conform you. What does Paul say? That the world is conforming our mind. Do not let the world conform your mind, but be renewed by the Spirit. Do not let your, so there's a world, there's an enemy trying to conform your mind, giving you lies, giving you deception, trying to have you believe in lies about who God is, just like he did in the garden. Did he really say that? Is he really doing that? You know, it's, 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 it's spiritual warfare. It's not spiritual battle. This is an ongoing, constant battle that's going on in your life, a war that is continually, there is an enemy that is continually trying to draw you away from God with these lies. And we continually, as followers of Christ, seek him. That's why when Jesus commanded the Spirit to leave, he said to never return. He didn't just say, go away. He said, go away and never return. Because we do know that the enemy will continue to try. If we don't say to never return, if we don't tell it to get lost forever, if we don't have our walls and our barriers and our boundaries against the enemy up, if we're not praying against that stuff, it seeps into our life. And some of you may know of people, and you yourselves may have experienced this, when you repent of these things and you're like, okay, and you overcome this, and the Lord meets you with favor... You know, we see this time and time again that the mass's initial response is negative. There's going to be doubt. When you, turn from the, when you repent from this disbelief, when you repent from the lies of the, of the enemy, the, the, the world is going to not believe you. They're going to look at you just as they looked at this boy and said, well, it's dead. You're dead. And the enemy will play the shame card. 
and say, well, you did this and this. You didn't believe this back in the day, so who are you to believe in now? But you guys, you got to ditch the shame and get in the game. Amen? Because Jesus lifts us out of our shame. What did he do to the boy? Everyone was saying he's dead, but what did Jesus do? Jesus went down, grabbed his hand, and lifted him up. Jesus lifts us out of our shame because he took that shame on the cross. And we are not defined by our unbelief. We are not defined by our past actions. We are defined by what Christ says over us, what our Heavenly Father says over us, and we are a new creation in him. You're a new creation in Christ. You know, I, I, I'm flabbergasted by this aspect of, of the kingdom. You know, we have, like, I'll, I'll share a couple stories just to kind of give you an idea of what I mean by this. We had, you know, I was serving in the chapel, and we had this lady come in. Prior to, she was, uh, she was chased by uh, sex traffickers, and she went to the chapel for, for shelter, and she was into, you, you know, everything. Drugs, alcohol, dealing drugs, um, crime across the board. And... Uh, <clears throat> She, she, after that encounter with the chapel um, and, and, and came into the chapel and then she kind of turned her life around, she came back to the chapel a little bit later and I was there and she wanted to meet with me because, uh, for reasons I don't, wanna, I don't need to get into today, but she wanted to meet with me and I shared the gospel with her and her first response to the gospel was like, nah, okay, sure, I don't really know about that kind of thing. I was like, how can you not? Like, look at your life, like, the Lord saved you. And anyways... I was gone for two weeks, and I came back. Dearly beloved, I can't tell you how this happened other than God. She was a completely different person, a new creation in Christ. She went from the darkness, living a life of darkness, doubt, unbelief, of, 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 of hatred for herself and others, and into a person of love, a person that seeks God, that trusts in God, seeks refuge into God. You know, and I see this time and time and time again in, our, in, in my ministry, where I see people who are broken and bruised and battered by the enemy come to Christ and are in a literal new creation. And it, it's a mystery. It flabbergasts me. I'm like, what? is going on here but it's so cool but that truth is for you too you are a new creation in Christ you are continually being renewed by God on a daily basis and we see you know what we can't what, what, what it is lo- supposed to look like in Isaiah 50 when we read it you know that we should have a tongue that is trained ears that listen and obey we don't cower in the face of scrutiny of man's disgrace but stand strong in faith and love because we don't look to man for for who we are in our our uh, accolades we look to god and if god is for us who could be against us amen Amen. <laughs> you know, so it says that let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on God. If there's no perceived light in us, we can still walk in the darkness because it's not our light that keeps us safe. It's his, and he is the light of the world. When we walk with Christ, when we follow him, we may be surrounded by darkness, but we don't need to fear. But yet, you know, Lord, I believe all these things. Help me with my unbelief. Because we're all redeemed, we're all new creations, but yet we still doubt from time to time. You know, I'm going to ask for some participation, and I know this is maybe new or, you know, different, um, and this is maybe uh, going to be a, a bit of vulnerability with one another, but we're a family, and it's good to be vulnerable with one another. <laughs> so who here, by show of hands, you know, has sometimes struggled with doubt or disbelief around who God is, who we are, you know, yeah. Amen? Look around. You're, you're not alone. And we all struggle with this. So how do we combat this? How do we combat the lies of the enemy? Who here has gone to a VBS? Show of hands. Who's gone to a VBS? You remember the song, read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow? You remember that song? It's true. It's very true. Okay? So we need to continually restore our mind with the Holy Spirit. So having that tight in relationship with our Heavenly Father. That is, that is key. With the Holy Spirit, He'll convict our hearts and our minds of, of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll lead us into all truth. He'll give us gifts to overcome these things. With Him, we can train our tongue. Because in James, it says, it cannot be done. But with God, it can be. Amen? But then also, your input is important. So reading your word, getting into his holy word. That song was beautiful, what we sang. I just loved that song. It was amazing. But it's so true. Get into the word on a daily basis. Pray to God on a daily basis. 
But then also your relationships. How's your relationship with God? How's your relationship with each other here? Do you have a community of support to remind you and speak truth and love over you? Which, if you don't know what that is, it's the gospel. Are we reminding each other of the gospel? Because that is what frees us from the darkness. Are you speaking life? There's power in your words. We see this in James chapter 3, that you can speak blessing or you can speak cursing. You can speak life or you can speak death. And are you speaking death? If we're speaking death, then why do we expect anything else in our life other than that? And if you're like, man, like I really have a hard time overcoming that. I complain a lot. I gossip a lot. I speak negatively a lot. Seek the Lord and he can help you train your tongue. By, control, by reading your Bible and praying more and, 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 and having a better input and association, I guarantee you that that will start to change. If you have an intentional effort behind it. But this still confounded the disciples. They were with Jesus every day, and they, yet they could not overcome the darkness here. And so when privacy, they asked Jesus, and they asked him, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Why would Jesus say that? It seems odd to me that they were with Jesus every day, so why would they need to pray? Just confounded me. But the reality is, is that they saw, the, the, the issue was that they saw the physical Jesus, and they put their faith in the physical Jesus. That's why they, they, they couldn't cast it out until Jesus was present. That's why he rebuked them, because like, how, like I'm going to be gone. Like, what are you going to do when I'm gone? He, had the, he needed them to realize and practice having a spiritual connection with God, that God is of spirit and love, that his power be, is beyond this physical understanding, this physical manifestation of his, of, of his creation, his power. That's why he, he gave accolades to the, the centurion, because the centurion was like, you don't need to come to my house, just say the words. He said, wow, that's amazing, great faith. There's no one greater, in, in a, I've not seen greater faith in Israel. So we pray not so that we can get things from God. We pray so that we can be aligned with God, so that our hearts can be aligned with God. And if our hearts are aligned with God, it helps us to be obedient. We actually know what he wants us to do. If, if I don't talk to my wife for a week, I have no idea what she, what's on my honey to-do list. Like, how, how do I know what she wants me to do until I talk to her? Same with God. You need, you need to align yourself, have a relationship with your Heavenly Father through prayer and getting into the Word. And then you can be obedient because you actually know what He wants you to do. And there is somebody's deliverance on the other end of your obedience. There is somebody's freedom and breakthrough. There are people on the edge of despair out there that are hoping that you come into their life and speak love and speak truth and show them who God is. That's the two things people, everybody in this world want, is they want a community that knows God and is tight-knit and is, is actually from the kingdom. They also want to know God. That's what they want. And are we a community like that at Grace? I haven't been here for a decade, but it seems to me you guys are pretty awesome. <clears throat> That's why I think what Jesus said when he said, if you can, is so powerful. It confounded me. I was like, what does he mean by that? So I looked into the Greek, and the Greek word is dunamahi, which means that you're capable, you're empowered to do so. And so Jesus encouraged, continually encouraged faith and belief that it could, that, that faith could do great things. Remember when he said, faith like a mustard seed could move mountains. So Jesus was saying, if you can, don't, don't just look to me. You're a child of God. You're a ch child of the kingdom. You serve Yahweh. You also could be empowered just as I am. So you can do this. We have authority here. We have power within us. But then the other thing I think he was meaning is that there is no ifs with the living God. There's no if with God. His power and love are constant. Faith receives the, gift, the gifts that God has prepared. <clears throat> and so through our obedience, he gives us gifts. He bestows upon it. So in that moment, he gives you the gift. If, if you encounter a, a, a young person who's you know, possessed by a demon, uh, in that moment, God will give you the gift to cast that out. I, I can't say that my ministry is deliverance, um, but he has put me in situations where I needed that gift. 
and he's given me the empowerment to do so. And I'm grateful for that because it would have been really kind of embarrassing, honestly, if he didn't. But I believed. Yet, there was still a seed of doubt. There was still a seed of unbelief. But I chose to obey anyways because the Holy Spirit empowers us to fight the lies of the devil. And that's the reality of all of this is that Jesus took the time to connect. This isn't about us, okay? As much as I've talked today to you about belief and unbelief and, 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 and seeking the Lord to help you with that, the reality is, is that this is not about you. See, if the disciples believed or not, it wouldn't have impacted that young man's life if they didn't care, if it wasn't about the boy. <clears throat> and so much, as much as um, it is about you, it's not about you. It's about the people out there who, who are on the edge of despair, who, who need Jesus in their life. So Jesus knew everything that was going on, yet he still took the time to connect with the Father, to, 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 to help them understand that it is possible. In a moment, in a few words, his son was going to overcome a lifetime of struggle. So to them it was a mountain, but to Jesus it was a molehill. And sometimes when we have the awareness of this, that it is just a molehill, if we treat it like that and connect and try to like, you know, be like that to people, they're not going to feel loved. They're not going to feel like you connect and love them. They're just going to feel like, oh, you think you're greater than me. You're self-righteous people. But if you take the time to connect and have empathy with people, just as Christ did here, um, it'll change their life. Because it's not just about the miracle. It's about the relationship. It's not just about them receiving deliverance and experiencing breakthrough. It's about them getting connected to their Heavenly Father. Them getting connected to their Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so it doesn't really matter if, you're the, if you align yourself with the disciples, the scribes, or the crowd, or the boy, or the father, and whatever the situation that is going on in your life, or uh, the life of somebody you love, the answer is Jesus. Amen. He is the only way out of the darkness for us and for them. So may he save us as he did this boy. May his peace and love, which surpasses all understanding, guard your heart and mind both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray.
Prosper in every place of preaching of your gospel. By your spirit, enable your pastors to proclaim the word with clarity and joy. By the same spirit, open the ears of your children to believe with gladness and action. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, guard your, Lord God, guard our tongues of our governing authorities, especially Justin and Danielle, that they may not stumble in what they say, but speak wisely, leading in accord with your will. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you have promised that all things are possible for one who believes. In such faith, we bring forth before you Jim and Marilyn Olson, Hildar Stead, Ted and Margaret Hansen, Erna Adam, and Henry and Caroline Simonson, and all others in need, asking you to grant them health and healing. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, O Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy kingdom, the power of the Lord, forever and ever. Amen. Honesty of children. I was so overwhelmed this morning with all the children here. Yeah. I see some of them have left. No, they're not. I thought it would be nice if the children all came up to the front. Okay. And moms or dads or whatever. And we'll just have a little pretend Sunday school. Should we do a children's message? Is that what you're asking, Erna? Just to show all of us that we were little and what a pleasure and privilege it is to have these little people with us. Dad, yeah, come on, kids, come to the front. Theo, come over here. Come here, son. <laughs> so, you want to do like a, like, a, like a children's message? Yeah, I don't have anything prepared. It's just <laughs> Well, what does Peter say? Peter says, always have a, you know, an explanation for the hope in your hands. Hey, Curtis. That's okay. They can hear. So... 
So everybody, can, can you say good morning? Good morning. Thank you. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. Yeah? Wow. Do you know Jesus loves me? Yeah. You do? Okay. I we know the song. Oh, way, that's wonderful. Well, it's so nice that you came to see all of us here because we love little children. Because Jesus loved little children too. And he said he just wants them to come to church like you came today. So thank you for coming. And I put, where, was there any other one there? I didn't want to come to church <laughs> that weekend. But this weekend you did, right? But last week Jesus did want me to come. No? Mm. Daddy, why does the door open? To let air flow. So can, can you say, Jesus, say it with me. Jesus, Jesus loves me. me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Yeah. <laughs> but Jesus loves me. Thank you. And I'll have the pastor just give us a little blessing. Sure. Hey, Theo. Just, just, yeah, just All right. Hey, kiddos. Kiddos, really. kiddos. Are you going to? Woo. Are you okay? Do you guys want to come up front here so I can see you? Curtis, why don't you come stand in front of me, please? Come, Amelia. They told people who the back. Well, no, I want you to stand right here so I can see you. Sure. Come here, Mimi. Theo, no. Okay. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. And Lord, you did say in your word to let the children come. And so, Lord, we pray that though they may face moments of doubt, moments of unbelief, that they, just like that father, come to you as you call them to come to, him, to you and seek you for belief, seek you for faith, seek you uh, in their time of need. We pray this in Jesus' name. And we bless them with a faith that impacts their neighborhood and this generation. Amen. Amen. May you all grow up to be like the, all the people out there and come to church, continue to come to church. Okay? Do you like church, Theo? We can come. I don't, I don't, I don't like, to like to be That's like okay. those You can people. come again. Okay? Yeah. okay. Next time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Go back to your seats. Back to your seats. No, not right now. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn.
What a Sunday. It was awesome. Thanks for having us. Um, it was, like I said, an honor and privilege, and i um, so grateful for this, uh, for this body of, of Christ. Um, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you. Thank you.